A great night's sleep begins with a great mattress, a therapeutic mattress. It's no secret the online world has been vital in the mattress industry in these days of COVID-19, and that's why we have our next speaker joining us once again. Mike Magnuson, the CEO of GoodBed.com, has become a fixture at these conferences. Mike has a great analytical mind. Mike is able to look at the online space and give us both micro and macro insights that are so vital. Uh, Mike and I have talked about what's happening in the industry these days, and Mike is saying he's seeing some record online sales. So it's always a good time to hear from Mike Magnuson, but this year especially so. So we welcome back to the bedding conference, Mike Magnuson of GoodBed.com. Mike, take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dave. It's uh, great to be part of this uh, virtual betting conference. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I also just want to maybe right off the bat, give my kudos to uh, the whole team, you, Dave, and, and, and the whole team of Furniture Today on how this conference has been going. Um, it's been uh, really impressive how you guys have pulled this off uh, in, um, in this totally new format. And I think it's it's opened up some some uh, some things that are really cool and weren't even possible in uh, in the traditional format. So uh, uh, kudos to all of you guys and, and thank you. Um, a couple other things uh, we can get out of the way right up front. A uh, little piece of uh, of trivia. Uh, I don't. I wish I had um, like a bunch of trophies in the background of my of my Zoom stream here, uh, like Warren Kornblum, or for that matter, a really cool electric guitar. I don't have any of that stuff. Um, but that little microphone over my right corner, uh, right shoulder, it is a microphone on which I recorded a couple of music videos uh, earlier during COVID. Um, and uh, one of the things we can get out of the way is uh, in case there are any pools on whether I'm wearing pants, I am. So uh, that's another, uh, another thing we can just check off. Uh, they are jeans though, which is another, which is one of those aforementioned improvements, I would say, to the virtual format of betting conferences. Um, so anyways, it's great, great to be here um, uh, and, and have a, a little time with you guys uh, to update you on what's been going on in the online world. And um, when I came up with the title of this talk, um, Welcome to the Omnichannel World, really um, what I was getting at was, was that the online and offline worlds are really converging. We've been talking about it for years, and I just feel like this is the year where we've really seen it finally uh, uh, come together. Uh, and so we're going to get into that a little bit more uh, in the talk, but, but that's really kind of the, the premise for what, what, what we're uh, going to be talking about today. Um, before I do start on that, though, I, I know I've uh, been kind of on this stage many times before. Uh, so most of you know what GoodBed is, but just for those of you who don't, GoodBed, we are building the world's largest and most trusted marketplace uh, for mattress shopping. Um, we help consumers find and buy the right mattress for them. Uh, we are the only independent uh, mattress information resource that, um, that provides a mix of both consumer ratings as well as editorial coverage. Uh, we also are the only one that is uh, completely agnostic to helping consumers through their journey, whether they want to buy online or in brick and mortar stores. And, and, and lastly, as far as um, gu our guidance goes, we're the only ones who are offering personalized and objective guidance to our readers. Um, and uh, beyond that, I, I wanna point out that um, we've really created a platform that from day one was designed to try to reward companies who make and sell good products and stand behind them. It's really core to the vision I have when I started Good Bed was that we could make help make this industry a better place by rewarding good companies who do good things. And so everything about our platform really from, from the very beginning has been designed with that uh, front and center. Um, so that's good, Bed. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, let's just dive into the material here. Um, in the past, I've, I've talked a lot about online mattress market share. Um, and uh, 
So I think I'll just go right into kind of how that has uh, changed. Now, this is an interesting year because we're a little off cycle. Uh, we normally meet in May and we talk about uh, the, the year that had been completed, you know, five months previously. Um, so as of the last time uh, I was on stage in May of 2019, we were talking about 2018 being close to 20%. Um, and what I'd say is 2019 uh, clipped off about the same amount of market share as we had seen in these last four or five years, basically, that sort of 3%-ish range, um, give or take. So I'm putting 2019 at somewhere between, say, 22 and 25% market share. Uh, and again, the way I think about the online market share is really all the percent of all retail sales that are through the online channel. So it, it's not based on if you're a D2C player, um, it's not, um, it, it's really just based on online as a channel. Um, so that's kind of where I think 2019 came in. That, and that equates to about 15% growth. Uh, in terms of how that breaks out, in terms of the, uh, the top five, uh, what I'm calling now disruptor brands, uh, as of I think last year is when I introduced that change in terminology. And it relates to this omni-channel convergence that I alluded to right up front, which is that um, you know the, the, the notion of an online brand or an offline brand or traditional brand or whatever you want to call the, 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 the other brands um, is, is pretty much uh, outdated at this point, obsolete, given this convergence that's happening and that we'll talk more about. So I'm calling them disruptor brands. Uh, and I'm showing here essentially like a, a, a rolling uh, top five brands uh, because obviously the top five has kind of changed a bit over time. But, uh, but it, in, in a sense, uh, you've seen 2019 uh, where they've clipped off another 30% in growth, uh, which is pretty consistent with, with uh, uh, what they had done in, in uh, 2018. Um, maybe, maybe just, um, maybe just a, a flattening only due to the, the scale increasing. Um, but the, uh, I'll, I'll just clarify on this slide, I'm talking about their total revenue. So when we say 30% growth, the vast majority of the revenue, especially going back uh, more than a year or two, is coming from online sales of mattresses, but we do include in these totals other sales of other products and sales that might happen through non-online channels. Um, so nonetheless, I think the point remains that in 2019, the top five brands did bite off, uh, I think, a bigger piece than their fair share, if you will, like more, more than their share of the growth um, that happened in the market. Um, so uh, coming back to um, uh, the, the online market share percentage, what I think is interesting, because now we're, we're in August, we can kind of really look forward to what 2020 is going to look like. Um, and I think it's interesting to reflect back, though, it, to January when I was first starting to think about what my remarks would be here. And I, 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 I was actually looking forward to presenting and sharing that I felt like this was going to be a really uh, a change, a year of, uh, 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 where there's something new going on, particularly uh, driven by the fact that so many of the biggest D2C brands uh, had placed a large emphasis on gr growth, achieving growth through brick and mortar. So I felt like we we're finally going to see maybe some signs of of slowing for the first time of the growth in, in terms of how much market share the online channel itself is, uh, is taking. Um, and so that, that was my expectation. I was looking forward to being able to share that interesting uh, inflection point that we were reaching. Um, and, and again, I, as I mentioned, the, a big part of the premise for that was this, was this focus from the largest players who, who have been responsible as we just saw a few slides ago for uh, a disproportionate share of the growth uh, in the whole online channel. Uh, they've been focusing on these, these brick and mortar rollouts. I mean, we saw Casper uh, had some announcements just in the past week as to retail showroom partners. I've got them listed, by the way, down the left and across the top, I've got the, uh, a few data points just organized by company owned stores. Uh, retail showrooms means uh, a wholesale partner where you can actually try, or consumers can actually try the product in the store, and then big box would be more of like a just a way to go pick it up locally uh, in your at a store in your local area if you can't try it. Um, and the uh, and so we saw Casper has got about I think 60 stores open to date with plans for much more. 
uh, in addition to the retail showrooms that they have recently announced. Uh, uh, Purple was probably the first to go down this path, and they've got, from what I uh, could gather, at least 1,500 stores in their network, uh, as well as a few uh, company-owned stores that they plan to pursue further uh, at some point down the line. And Nectar, uh, again, my numbers might be understating here, but uh, two, over 2,000 at least uh, in, in their retail store network uh, it, it is what I was able to gather. Um, so those are some really uh, big examples of this. And then, uh, but then if you look down the remainder of the list, all the other uh, brands do have at least their own company owned stores at this point, uh, at least one of their own company owned stores. And a lot of them, most of them are also experimenting with retail showroom partners. So it really has been kind of a notable shift in the market in the past, uh, well, since at least uh, 2019. Um, you know, the beginning of 2019, that, that's, we've really seen that happening. Um, and in terms of the reason for that, I think it's really um, important to share a little context here. Um, this is a, uh, some data that we collect from our readers uh, where we ask them if they would like to try a mattress in a store uh, before they buy. Um, and we've been tracking this since, as you can tell, uh, the third quarter of, of 2015. So just about a year after Casper launched. Um, and what you could see is, uh, and by the way, the orange line is just the kind of inverse of the blue line. That's why they look like mirror images uh, because they are. But the, uh, the, the orange line is basically people who say uh, that they are willing to buy without trying in a store first. And, um, and what you can see is that it rises sharply in the early days uh, when Casper was uh, relatively new on the scene still. And in fact, if we had started tracking this previously, uh, you know, prior to going back to before Casper's launch, it would have probably started close to zero. Uh, I mean, certainly in the single digits. So this was a very sharp rise uh, as the DDC kind of revolution uh, took hold, and, but it really started to uh, plateau around the beginning of 2018. We just saw that, it, it, that there was a, a hard point of resistance at about um, at about 43 percent, and uh, and that started. They hit that number in about uh, early 2018, and it really did not budge. And so, uh, what you started to see was for. Uh, during the 2016, 17, and 18 timeframe, there had been a lot of new brands coming into the market. And it was around the time that we hit this point of resistance that we finally started to see attrition in those brands. Uh, there was just no way uh, without growth in terms of the addressable uh, customer base for a new entrance to be uh, uh, to, to flood in so, uh, with any success. Um, so, but the other thing you started to see is that these bigger brands started to realize right around the same time frame, they started to realize that they were reaching this, this kind of point of resistance and that if they were going to maintain their, uh, their big growth rates that they had uh, promised investors and, and become accustomed to, they were going to have to find a way to uh, cater to those remaining 57% of the people who, who do really want to try it before they buy it. Um, so that's really when they started laying the groundwork for their brick and mortar plans, which, which came to fruition, uh, which started to come to fruition mostly during 2019. Um, so uh, so that's, that's some context here. And by the way, just some additional context about this, I think that you might find interesting. Um, we looked at this by age as well, and um, willingness to buy without trying certainly does. This is now just people, all we're showing here is, uh, by age group, what is the willingness to buy without trying? So uh, not surprisingly, the age group that has the least willingness to buy without trying is the oldest age group, the over 65. That's the green line down at the bottom. And the younger age groups, the orange and the blue, are up near the top um, with the highest willingness. But what's interesting to me uh, is that they all kind of go relatively in lockstep over time. And uh, it's also interesting to me that no group is, uh, is wholly unwilling or wholly willing. Uh, so even young people, for example, there's still over 40% of them that really would prefer to try the bed in a store before buying it. And even amongst the oldest, oldest group of people, there's still you know, 25 to 30% of them that, uh, that are willing to buy without trying. So, um, so just further, further interesting data there. Um, 
So going back to the online mattress market share and what all that meant for 2020 is I was expecting, given this point of resistance that we had hit, uh, given all the emphasis amongst the big growth engine drivers of these, these big brands, these big D2C brands, given their emphasis on achieving growth through non-online sales, uh, I was expecting a more modest year of growth for 2020, uh, something more along the lines of you know, say 10% growth. So still a couple of percentage points, maybe maybe even uh, two to three percentage points of market share, um, but but not north of three, uh, let alone closer to four as we've seen in some years uh, in, in the past. So just kind of the very beginnings of a starting to a slow uh, is what I was expecting. But then of course, we all know the world has changed since January. Um, and we've seen it uh, in many ways, but we also see it in this very data. What we see is that in, 20, uh, in, in April of 2020, or starting in March, obviously, but in April, it literally spiked up to over 70% of people saying that they're, that they're willing to buy without trying in a store. Uh, which is just a radical, radical change, as you can see. I mean, we had really gotten to the point where it was going to be generational turnover that was going to drive, you know, any incremental change in this graph. Uh, that's how slow it, it was looking. And then all of a sudden, we went from 43 to 71 in the span of 30 days. Um, so uh, what we can say, though, is that it seems to have settled down. Obviously, it has definitely come down. Um, and um, I'm just trying to move my uh, Zoom panel so I can actually see my full screen. Um, there we go. Um, and But where, where it has settled down is at about 53%. So a full 10 percentage points higher than it was pre-COVID. So whereas we felt like we were kind of locked in at this 43% ceiling, we just took a, a step change um, and now who knows if this is going to hold uh, this 53% number uh, is going to hold, you know, indefinitely. Could it rise further? Uh, should COVID, um, you know, take a, another turn for the worse? Could it settle back down a bit more? Should things improve more quickly? W we don't know, but I do think it's interesting to note that it is, has been pretty consistent uh, for three months now. This data goes all the way up through August, probably 18th. We just pulled it uh, a couple days ago. So it's, very fresh data. Um, so I, I just think it's interesting that that has been some, there has been some consistency around that 53% number. Um, so given this, uh, I, I think it's also, by the way, it's worth noting in this graph that symbolically, uh, the fact that the lines have now crossed and that there is now, there are now more people who say they are uh, willing to buy without trying than there are the other, uh, that, that I think also has some symbolic interest. Um, I also just since we talked about age group before, I want to show you this change in the willingness to buy without trying has also been very consistent um, uh, across age groups. Um, so uh, the title of this slide actually should is, is maybe a, a little bit uh, whoops is a little bit uh, misleading because the uh, the real takeaway here is that the there's been a lot of consistency to the fact that like the impact that COVID has had. Every age group spiked up and every age group settled back at a level that is higher than where they went into COVID. Okay. Um, in terms of the impact of COVID, we've seen it in other areas as well. Um, this is a, uh, an overview of uh, searches for the top disruptor mattress brands over the past six years, like six years being kind of taking us back to roughly the, the launch of Casper. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, all these disruptor brands saw a spike as it relates to COVID, a, a spike and then a little, most of them saw a little settling uh, after uh, the first initial spike, but they all saw that same, that same spike. And by the way, one thing that uh, astute observers will notice here who, who've uh, seen me present this type of uh, data before is that we have uh, a new member of the top five most searched for disruptor brands, which is uh, Avocado. So uh, they have uh, they've been 
uh, really increasing in, in their uh, search volume. So they are now in, in that top five group uh, for the first time. Um, but it's also interesting to note if we look at just the today's most searched mattress brands overall for that same time period. Uh, so we're no longer distinguishing between disruptor brands and uh, not, you know, incumbent brands. Um, the uh, the brands, the uh, disruptor brands, saw more of a spike than the incumbent brands did when COVID hit. And so again, that sort of ties to this idea that um, there was a change in the psyche of the consumer, and that that change uh, skews towards buying online. Um, unsurprisingly, in fact, the uh, the change in the case of Nectar was so striking relative to the uh, incumbent brands that Nectar actually ended up uh, entering the top five most searched for brands for the first time. So they are also new to this, this graph, this chart. Um, they, as a result of the spike they got during COVID, they, they now enter the top five. Um, and then of course, uh, you, could, you could also see this just in terms of more general search data, non-branded search data as people uh, are, are searching for the two most common things they search for, which is best mattress and mattress reviews. Um, mattress reviews being uh, something that people who search uh, kind of more broadly across brick and mortar and online would search for, but best mattress being something that particularly online mattress buyers search for. That one spiked up, both spiked up a little bit, but best mattress spiked up uh, even more. Uh, and I think that again points to just uh, uh, positives of, as it relates to the, the share that's likely to go to online uh, this year. So uh, going back to my forecast, uh, that should actually say 10% growth. That was uh, my initial forecast back in January. And now I'm revising that upward. Um, so I, it's, it's, it's really hard to say at this point, but uh, certainly I, 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 I my guesstimate is between 30 and 35%. And I, my sense is it's gonna be somewhere towards the lower end of that. So that's where I plotted it around 31% um, in terms of the actual share for 2020 of, of uh, the online channel, uh, which, rule, which uh, ties out to about a 35% growth rate, uh, which is obviously far more, um, uh, far bigger growth than the 10% that I might've thought back in January. Uh, but it's also interesting to note that uh, if I had asked, if I had put this same graph together back in April, I would have thought that the percentage was going to be up closer to 40%. So actually, in the last four months uh, time frame or so, I would say that my optimism for brick and mortar has actually increased. I've seen just based on what we've seen um, how that channel has rebounded in the last uh, during COVID. So that's kind of my forecast at this point for 2020. Um, in terms of uh, the disruptor brands, again, I feel like they're going to clip off about 30% growth uh, yet again this year. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, that was last year, and but then again, they're going to clip off 30% this year. Um, so uh, in terms of how that breaks out by brand, again, we have um, uh, I think a new entrance to the top five, most likely. It's it's probably of all the numbers on this uh, chart, all of which are kind of estimates that, that we pulled together, the avocado estimates are probably have the least empirical data behind them. But nonetheless, based on what we are seeing in the market, we, I do think that by, by the end of 2020, they will have a spot in the top five of uh, these disruptor brands. That's, so that's why they are now included on this chart. Uh, but as you can see, all the brands are up this year. Uh, which actually has not necessarily been the case in some of the recent years uh, for all of the top five. Um, one other thing to note here, I think on this point, uh, I think it's just interesting. We in the past, this is a slide that I, I showed you first in May of 2018. Uh, the purpose of the slide was to talk about the importance in my view of manufacturers being able to sell direct as a way of building a brand. And to illustrate that, that importance, I pointed out uh, that at that point in time, uh, which remains true to this day actually, uh, only three brands had reached a half a billion sales uh, in the past hundred years. Uh, only, you know, in terms of like brands founded in the past hundred years, only three of them had reached that half a billion mark. 
Uh, and the last two of which, uh, Sleep Number and Tempur-Pedic, uh, both did so uh, on the back of direct selling. And you even heard a little bit, uh, you got to hear from Rick Anderson, uh, some of the history of the Tempur-Pedic story on that front. Um, so I pointed out in, in 2018 that, that here were six brands that were really poised to potentially become the next brand to reach that benchmark. Uh, on the back of them uh, having this direct sales focus. Um, at the time, by the way, um, all six of those brands combined amounted to less than a billion dollars in revenue. But it's interesting to note that I really do think based on the data I showed you uh, a couple of slides ago, that this year, 2020, it's very likely that three of those brands will cross that benchmark. Okay, so um, for the rest of my time, I, I wanted to go back to what I originally, uh, when I was uh, teeing this up at the beginning, I, I talked about how well, when I came up with the title of this presentation, it was uh, about omni-channel. And I thought it was worth uh, reflecting on what I meant by that because omni-channel has a lot of different meanings. And at the very basic level, you think of omni-channel as, um, as really just meaning uh, customers should be able to uh, shop and buy however, wherever they want. Um, uh, it also has, uh, is as commonly used as it relates to marketing, meaning your marketing needs to reach them wherever they are um, and uh, where, whenever they, they want it, whether that's social media, email, TV, or what have you. Uh, and likewise, your operations need to line up with that omni-channel strategy in terms of there needs to be an alignment between your in-store uh, experience as well as your online and, and experience and your experience across all channels. Um, but when I was talking about like this being the omni-channel world, uh, I was certainly talking about those things, but I was also talking about how if you're living in that world where um, everybody has to serve the customer wherever and however they want, well, that includes manufacturers. They've got to be able to reach that customer. They've got to be able to sell direct, as we just uh, were talking about. Um, and, and, and we've started to now see that happen. Like more and more of, of the incumbent brands have started to dip their toe in that water. Um, but likewise, the brands that started as online brands, uh, they've also got to be wherever the customer needs to be. They've got to be, which means they got to be in store. So they've been, as we talked about, they've been going that direction. And ultimately, consumers start to just no longer distinguish between online and offline brands. It really becomes uh, irrelevant to them. Um, and so I, that, that's kind of a broader context of like, that's the world that we're living in. And I wanted to talk about, uh, just uh, give you some insights that from what I see as to like, what are the longer term implications of the fact that we've now crossed that chasm? Um, and, you know, I've thought about like a lot of the panelists this week, uh, they've done a really good job covering some of the specifics around uh, what you should be doing in terms of like implementing those omni-channel marketing or omni-channel operations or, uh, or what have you. So I, I just didn't feel like it was the best use of our time for me to get into more of that. And so instead, I, I'm going to spend the rest of my time um, talking about uh, some of the threats that I think retailers face. And we, we covered uh, three threats last year. And they're actually the same three threats that I would think are uh, the biggest uh, threats to the industry right now. But, but in, last year, we focused on the first two mostly. This year, we're going to focus on the third one. As you remember, the first one was ultra cheap mattresses. We talked about how uh, ultra cheap mattresses represent uh, really an existential threat to, to market share because they're, uh, they're, they're training consumers to think of mattresses as a disposable item, uh, which is the direct opposite of something that uh, where you'd invest in quality. They're training consumers to believe that uh, uh, you can get a great mattress for $300. Um, and, uh, and certainly I believe that the risk of cannibalization far outweighs the potential upside that might come from market expansion and selling ultra cheap mattresses. So that remains uh, truly a, a disruptive threat to the industry. Likewise, we talked about Amazon, who uh, by no coincidence is the biggest purveyor of ultra cheap mattresses. Um, 
And we talked about how their platform fundamentally uh, leads to a race to the bottom. It's just inevitable the way their platform is designed. And that's because uh, they only give you two ways to win, price and ratings. And mattresses as a product are unique in that uh, high ratings come very easily for, for cheap products in this category. Uh, that's because of the fact that uh, ratings are asked for uh, only a couple you know, weeks after owning them before anything has a chance to go wrong. And because of course, there's a lot of self-selection bias as to who buys an ultra cheap mattress from Amazon. They don't tend to have the highest of expectations. So when the mattress arrives, it comes out of the box and indeed it is a mattress check and it, and it was cheap check then it basically has already met all their expectations and is likely to get five stars. So, uh, and if cheap mattresses have high ratings, then guess what? All mattresses have to have high ratings and it's still not enough to, to have high ratings <laughs> and be more expensive. You pretty much also have to be cheap. So there's really no way to escape this inevitable race from the bottom uh, in the Amazon sphere. Um, so that uh, obviously both of those things still remain uh, threats, and arguably they both increased in their potency. Uh, we we all know how uh, Amazon's power has increased over the past uh, over this COVID period. Um, so certainly uh, those both of those threats I think are are uh, every bit as clear and present as they were a, a year and a half ago or whenever we were last talking. Uh, but at the same time, they they kind of the very nature of them is very much the same as it was. Um, the third threat was review sites. And review sites actually is the one where we spent the least amount of time in last year's talk. Uh, and it's the one where there's been the most change in my view. Review sites, I believe, are now the biggest competitor for mattress retailers. Um, they are standing in between uh, the consumer and discovering stores. Uh, and that's because more and more of the customer journey has been moved online. And these guys have become much, much, much more dominant uh, in that sphere uh, to the point where they really can't be avoided um, by consumers. And, um, and if you, whether you search for best mattress, mattress reviews, some comparisons, all the top things consumers are likely to start with uh, as they turn to the internet to begin their journey uh, they're gonna find these websites. Um, and it's just, it's really uh, unfortunate for retailers who, uh, who are now having to compete essentially with these uh, review sites that consumers don't have a clear sense that these sites are in effect retailers. And that gives them a massive, and what I would argue is unfair advantage in this competition with retailers. Um, so I want to dive into that a little bit more. Um, what makes review sites a competitive threat to retailers? Well, again, as I said, consumers can no longer avoid them. They just, they're, they're, they're everywhere. Uh, in fact, uh, there are, uh, they have not only expanded in number, but, uh, but they've just also become much more aggressive in their uh, search engine optimization techniques. And we'll get into that a little bit more of that later. Um, another reason they're a threat is that they are retailers. I mean, fundamentally, uh, their content, uh, if I'm speaking of them, certainly as a group, their content is designed first and foremost to sell rather than to be right. Um, and they are, uh, frankly, they're pay to play. Um, so if you want to be uh, the best mattress in some category, you've got you, you've got to have, uh, you've got to make them the most money. Um, so uh it's, it's selling, uh, it's just positioned as something else. Um, and the fact that they claim to be unbiased, it really does give them unfair advantages as it relates to uh, the consumer's perception. Um, and, it's, it, and, and I think it's just, for me, as I thought about this from the standpoint of a retailer, uh, it's just, it's so striking to me that like, it's not a fair fight for you. Um, I mean, it's uh, to, so it's not enough to say uh, that you need to just be better and do all these things that we talk about with Omnichannel. Um, if, if, uh, if somebody's stealing signs in the dugout, you know, you're, <laughs> it's not a fair fight. Um, and uh, that's, you, you, there's, there's just um, uh, 
a, an unlevel playing field here. And so that, that's something that we need to uh, address. Um, the other thing that makes them competitors is that their economics are starting to much more closely resemble a retailer. And just you know, to, to state the obvious, a lot of people would think of us as a review site. Uh, and what I mean by this last bullet point is that their economics are starting to look a lot more like uh, a retailer's economics than they do our economics. Um, commissions are going up uh, markedly um, and, uh, and their contribution margins are starting to look a lot more like the, the business of a retailer. Um, so in terms of the recent developments, just to give you some context, there's now over 135 of these websites. So when I say they're everywhere, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. There's just, they're not only on page one, they're two, three, four, five, six. I mean, they're way, they're impossible to avoid. Um, their revenue is growing uh, quickly. As I mentioned, the commissions are also, uh, the percentages are going up uh, markedly over the past year or two. Um, millions of dollars are being made at this point, probably across all these websites. Uh, and it's not in any way evenly distributed, by the way, but across all of them, um, you know, we're talking about $50 million of revenue probably uh, that's being made by these websites. Um, they're also becoming much more powerful and sophisticated. We're seeing, um, we're seeing a lot of consolidation, uh, for example. Here's, there's three groups that have really kind of emerged as consolidators in this space. All of them are backed by uh, venture capital or private equity. Um, and they're starting to pull together portfolios of sites, uh, both by just launching a bunch of sites as well as by acquiring them. Um, and so this is becoming professionalized, if you will. And, and by the way, I put in the title here, Mattress Review Spammers are building portfolios of sites. You know, one of the reasons I chose that word is because I just fundamentally, from my standpoint, don't see any reason why you would ever have multiple sites in a category other than to spam Google results. That's fundamentally the only reason to have that. Uh, I mean, we certainly have never felt any compulsion to take some of our content and put it on a different domain. And the only reason I could ever see doing that is to spam Google results so that I can have not only spot one, but also spots two, three, four, and five. Um, so that's what's happening right now. Um, they're becoming more powerful, more sophisticated, much more well-funded, um, and increasingly deceptive. Um, their corporate ties um, are not clearly revealed. Uh, as I've mentioned last year, there are over 20 sites that have corporate ties to mattress brands. Um, and in most cases, these ties are not readily apparent to an average consumer. Um, another, another thing is um, they are representing themselves. This is, this is just sort of like uh, emblematic of the kind of deception that they, that they use, just an example, uh, but representing themselves as charities and nonprofits as a way to garner trust from the consumer. So we talked about how just claiming to be unbiased is, is one way that they garner trust unfairly vis-a-vis -vis you, a retailer, but, but they take it further than that. They pretend to be uh, nonprofits. I mean, there are thousands of websites out there that have links. I'm, I don't mean to single out Tuck, but they just happen to have uh, you know, their actions happen to be fantastic examples of the kinds of uh, things that these websites are doing. Um, there are thousands of websites that out there that, that uh, claim that Tuck Sleep Foundation is a nonprofit. So they went out at some point to these websites and told them that they were a nonprofit. Those websites, many of whom were nonprofits themselves, uh, linked back to them. Um, that gave them a ton of uh, uh, SEO benefit. Uh, these are sites that like Google would look at as very authoritative because, you know, here, here's an organization uh, focused on child care services. Um, here's this one here is a resource for elderly Jewish people in Washington, D.C. That, that, that we're told that this is a nonprofit. These are not organizations that would likely link to a, a for-profit mattress review website, uh, but maybe linking to a nonprofit focused on sleep. That seems like something they, they might be open to. So that's what they were told apparently. Um, this is a, a .edu domain that's known as like SEO gold. Um, 
here's an, uh, here's a dot gov again very author considered very authoritative all of which um, uh, were were gained in this in this way um, another thing uh, they're doing is um, sorry you gotta use my there's what we call uh, black hat SEO tactics. Um, now, uh, many of you guys uh, have heard of this organization called National Sleep Foundation. What you may not know uh, that's happened in the last uh, six months or so, maybe, maybe nine months, is that uh, the National Sleep Foundation websites, sleepfoundation.org and sleep.org, have been acquired and are now run by Tuck. There are now mattress review websites. Um, this all happened kind of very silently under the radar. In fact, if you go to sleepfoundation.org's homepage right now, you'll have no sense of this, that this change took place uh, in that there's no mattress reviews mentioned on the homepage that might raise attention to this or raise an eyebrow from the likes of people, researchers and academians and, and uh, other folks who have um, kind of become used to going to this website and treating it as a real authoritative resource. Um, so those websites are now uh, mattress review websites. Um, and it has been uh, a, a, a raging success in, in the sense of tricking Google. Uh, Google uh, basically has looked at these websites, which are 25 to 30 year old websites with tons of backlinks coming from Re medical researchers and universities and all kinds of uh, hugely authoritative websites, all of whom believed at the time and, and were right in believing that they were linking to a nonprofit organization. And uh, as a result, that incredible backlink authority uh, was, was very powerful and it was seen as a very authoritative website. So when they decided to add content like best mattress of 2020, and best mattress for you know side sleepers or whatever, they uh, Google thought, wow, this must be the most definitive article there is on this topic, and they started ranking them very highly, or very quickly. Um, so again, that's a very aggressive black hat SEO technique in my mind. I mean, I guess that's my opinion that it's black hat. There's no rule book per se, but uh, certainly it, it would appear to me that those links were bought and. Buying links is the number one verboten rule, uh, according to Google. Um, so uh, the other thing that's worth noting, by the way, here is I was, I've been surprised to see how the National Sleep Foundation continues to be uh, uh, kind of complicit in all this. The, uh, the trademarks of the National Sleep Foundation apparently are, are authorized for ongoing use by sleepfoundation.org, by the Tuck team. So um, it's very confusing to the consumer. Not only is it a .org, not only is it um, the word foundation is in the URL, uh, giving the consumer a very clear sense that this is a charity that they're getting information from, not a for-profit uh, organization. But on top of that, um, they're actually able to use National Sleep Foundation trademarks uh, of an actual charity that's 25, 30 years old. So. Um, why are these review sites such a competitive threat to retailers? Well, um, here's the thing. These sites actively dissuade consumers from shopping at your stores and buying the brands that you carry. Um, I just did a little, uh, a little look at, at these, some of these websites, sleepfoundation.org, just as an example. These are some uh, uh, select quotes from, from their websites as to when should you shop in a store? Well, it's when, you should shop in a store if you're a skilled negotiator or if you are easily overwhelmed by too many options. Uh, when should you shop online? Well, if you happen to be amongst the group of people who want the most bang for your buck, then yeah, I guess you should shop online. Or if you happen to be amongst that small group of people who doesn't like sales pressure, um, or if, this is funny, if you wanna read trusted reviews. Um, so Sleepopolis, uh, their advice for when to shop in a store is if you're less concerned with price, Whereas if you want, if you should shop online is if you want the best price. Um, Mattress Nerd, uh, they said what you should do, when you should you shop in a store? If you wanna test the mattress first, after which you should still go find it online to get the lowest price. <laughs> so when should you shop online? It was kind of not clear what their advice was. I didn't really see a scenario where they recommended that. Um, so these are sites that are um, 
we talked about how the fact that the consumer cannot avoid these websites. And when they are on these websites, uh, they're not only getting explicit advice uh, that is encouraging them to not shop in your stores, they're also getting a lot of implicit uh, advice based on uh, how these guys talk about traditional brands versus the online brands and so forth. Um, so the bottom line is someone who lands on one of these sites, uh, the second they land on one of those sites, you become a lot less likely to ever see them. Um, why are uh, these sites a competitive threat? Well, the second reason is um, by, by dominating the organic traffic we just talked about, uh, they're preventing people from finding you online. And the last reason, and this is really kind of a, a poignant uh, inflection point that we're at now that highlights the urgency of the moment right now. As the commissions in this category go up, and they are going to continue to go up because the fact that uh, these websites, this is a very efficient channel for retailers. Um, it, it continues to be an efficient channel, even, even at the today's elevated commission rate. So I believe that these, these commission rates will continue to go up. And particularly as these guys have consolidated, their market power has increased. They have the ability to really position themselves as kingmakers. Um, and if you don't want to pay, then you don't get the play. Um, so as these commissions start to go up, though, we reach a very uh, critical moment here. And that critical moment is that the economics are reaching a tipping point where they can now start to outbid retailers for ads. Um, and just a little bit of math here, how advertising works. The cost side of, of, of advertising, at least online, is about your bid and your click-through rate. So for those of you who know this, I apologize, but for those of you who don't, I'll just make it quick here. Um, this is, let's say this is you, a retailer, and you bid $4 and 1% of people who see your ad click on it. Well, that makes Google four cents. A review site, because of the fact that they're claiming to be unbiased and therefore consumers are more likely to see them as a useful information resource, uh, they're more likely to get clicked on their ad all else being equal, position and everything else, they're more likely to get clicked on, maybe 2% click on it. Therefore, they only have to bid $2 for that same slot in order to make Google the same amount of money. And that's, by the way, how Google prioritizes who gets what slot, it's how much money they make. So on the cost side, they have an advantage, an unfair one, as we talked about. Um, these are illustrative numbers, by the way. I don't, these are not exact numbers, of course. Uh, but on the revenue side, they also have an advantage. In the revenue side, the math goes, uh, you have your revenue per sale, you have your contribution margin from that revenue, uh, your conversion rate on, on any lead that you get, that all multiplies together to get your, your total contribution per lead. And that's how much you can bid. That's the max you can bid or else you're losing money on your ad. So if you uh, have $1,000 sales, 40% contribution margin and a 1% conversion rate, you can bid up to $4 for a click. Um, if the review site though, let's say they got the same revenue per sale, in the past, their contribution margin, which is basically their commission, uh, may have been like 10%, even go back far enough, it was 5%. Um, their conversion rate though is gonna be higher. Why is it gonna be higher? It's gonna be higher because they're saying they're unbiased. So when you have sales oriented content and they have sales oriented content, all else being equal, their sales oriented content comes with this uh, this, this claim that, hey, and we're telling you all this great stuff about this product and we're unbiased. Well, guess what? That has a higher conversion rate. And as a result, their contribution uh, per lead, uh, the, in the past they had uh, with 10% contribution margin, uh, they were at, that closes the gap for contribution per lead. But in the past with a 10% contribution margin, it still wasn't enough to compete with you for clicks. But now, as their contribution margin is increasing, this is the critical inflection point I was talking about, they can now uh, outbid you. So let's say they've got a 25% contribution margin, that same conversion rate advantage, well, now they literally can outbid you for that, for that lead. So not only, uh, even at uh, $2, even when they bid $2, according to that last slide, we saw they might still get the same spot as you in the Google Ads ranking. But if they're bidding $5 or they can afford to bid up to $5, they're going to way outrank you. So this is a really critical inflection point as it relates to the math here uh, as, as far as the threat that retailers face. Um, 
what can be done? Well, I look at this and I sort of see this, um, this is like a, one of those movie monsters that's just like out of control and, and seems like impossible to stop. But luckily they do have one vulnerability. Um, and that is that everything that they have right now is predicated on consumers believing that they're trustworthy. And I believe that if consumers knew everything we talked about today, they would not believe these sites are trustworthy. Um, so if consumers can find a viable alternative that is trustworthy, they would stop using these sites altogether. To me, that's like the sword stick stuck right between the eyes of the beast. Like you have to do exactly in that special place. This is the only way to, to sort of slay this beast um, is you have to just stick the sword right there. Um, so what does that mean? What, what's required in terms of action? Well, consumers need to be educated with the truth. Um, that probably means a PR effort at some point. Um, that definitely means sales training. Uh, your, re your retail sales associates need to be able to educate consumers on the information sources that they're using. Uh, this was actually mentioned by uh, Warren Kornblum, I think, in his talk. Um, and uh, so they need to be able to speak to those sources and, and, uh, and help educate their consumers on them. And uh, it probably needs to be done on your website too, because some of these people are never gonna make it to your store. Uh, with the information based on the information they're getting online. So you need to use your websites as a tool as well to help educate consumers about this. Um, and then of course, we all know nature abhors a vacuum. Um, so, uh, you know, even if, you know, we, we can kill these weeds, uh, they're gonna have to be something really strong and healthy planted there in its place or else more weeds will pop up. So consumers need to be steered towards trustworthy alternatives. Um, and in that respect, I would just say, uh, you know, Goodbed, since we started, um, has really always been about truth, honesty, and integrity. Um, we're in this together with you, and we need, we need to work together to, to really slay this beast. I really see this as, uh, as the only way. And I can just tell you that we we care about this industry. We care about consumers. We have been doing this longer than any of these guys. And if we wanted, uh, our economics could look exactly like theirs, but we've made the choice. We've made a conscious choice that's cost us a lot of money that we don't wanna make money that way because we care about the industry and we care about consumers. And we, we believe in this idea of living in a world we're good companies who make and sell good products and who stand behind them can be rewarded for those things. That's the world we want to live in. That's the world that I tried to create when, when I started Good Bed. So our fortunes are tied. The only way to beat these guys is for us to band together and bring truth to light. And if we don't succeed in that, you know, a bunch of you guys are going to go out of business and so will we. So we couldn't be more aligned. And uh, I would just urge you that if you're in a position of influence in this industry, uh, whether as manufacturer, retailer, uh, buying group, and we're not already working closely together, please reach out to me and um, let's talk about how we can slay this piece together. Well, Mike, that was very thought provoking. Uh, that there was great journalism there. You have given us so much to think about. And as I think about it, I'm uh, gotta admit, I'm a little bit depressed to be honest, but the call, <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, the call to action I think is exactly, is exactly right. Um, and I think, you know, the truth, we have a saying in journalism, you know, truth will always out. The truth eventually will, will come out. I think you've done a masterful job of laying all this out. Um, I, I guess our, our, our audience is just like me, they're kind of taking all this in. And this is a reminder that uh, uh, some of my, uh, many of these slides I think will be available for you all in the conference uh, binder. And uh, this is something that obviously needs to be studied carefully. Um, Mike, 
as you, um, and this is a reminder to our viewers to go ahead and be submitting your questions. We've got several and uh, we'll get to those in just a second. Uh, Mike, as you look out there at the retail landscape, are any retailers at this point um, starting to heed the advice you've given or is this issue just now kind of breaking for retailers awareness? Are you talking about this last issue I was discussing with the yes, review sites? Yes, the last review sites. No, I, I don't think they are. Uh, I don't think this has been on the radar. And that's ultimately, this is why I chose to spend, you know, the latter part of my talk on this topic, because I just felt like there's a lot of things I can, I can talk about um, that are important. But uh, this is the one thing that, but that, it, that you probably don't already know about and are, aren't already thinking about that can make all the other stuff you're doing right. meaningless if we, if we don't get this right. So I you felt know, it was really important. Uh, yeah, and I can't, again, I can't emphasize how important it is. Mike, do you think there's any danger that some retailers might just want to play that same terrible game? There probably is. It's probably a temptation like, oh, you can't beat them, join them is kind of the old adage. The, the reality though is the economics will never work. Right. Um, You'll, you'll, and, and these guys are, are masters at maximizing their economics. And so what's going to happen if, if, that, if anyone goes down that path is that they won't be able to offer the kind of economics that are needed to be a top recommendation, to be, to be one of the ones that uh, gains business from this platform. And as a result, all they'll be doing is offering up content to these websites that will ultimately be used to sell other people's products. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna jump into some questions here for you, Mike. Uh, first of all, uh, can you speak briefly to how those tremendous numbers that you presented were gathered? Uh, sure, I, I, I'm guessing they're talking about the um, like Maybe. percentage who try, wanted willingness to try in store and so forth. Yeah, now that's, we, your, that's your data, isn't it? That's our data, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I have sources on all the slides that have numbers on them, uh, so okay. some of them, are my estimates, you know, as it relates to market share or company um, uh, revenues and so forth, certainly projections. Uh, I obviously base uh, those sorts of things as I look at uh, performance of other companies on largely publicly available information that I've compiled. Uh, in some cases, I'm able to sanity check it against data that we have uh, access to through our, our website, of course. Um, and um, but uh, some of the slides, the ones that are actually come from good bed data, those are, those are actually coming from our our users. They're based on thousands and thousands of data points of, of uh, information that our users have provided to us in the course of uh, using good bed to shop for a mattress. OK. All right. Here's another question. Uh, this one specifically asks about if you can uh, talk about what might explain the rapid sales deceleration during 2Q in Casper's D2C numbers, despite the increased willingness of shoppers to buy without trying. Um, I like the theory. Well, first of all, I'm not totally sure. I have to spend a little bit more time with the financials to, to be sure uh, whether that number includes their physical stores or not. So if that D to C number does include the owned and operated stores of which they actually have more than anyone, uh, then the closure of those stores on a year over year basis would obviously uh, offset some of the gains that they might've seen on, on online sales. Um, but uh, so, so that's, that's part of it. The, or that could be part of it. Uh, the other part of it could be that, that Casper is really trying to, um, accelerate their path to profitability so they are they're kind of being more judicious about uh how they spend how they acquire customers online in this very competitive environment and when they can't make their uh return on investment work they're dialing those investment dollars back relative to what they were doing a year ago as they were prepping and ramping up to go public so i think that's another possible explanation here okay uh, speaking of cost of acquisition, uh, cost of acquisition for the online consumer uh, came down during the COVID period, didn't it? Uh, sure, it did. That was largely uh, less to do with the le lower competitiveness in the mattress market and more to do with lower competitiveness just in the overall advertising environment. So you have entire sectors of, of advertisers that are just sitting on the sidelines who normally 
are out there essentially bidding up these these ad dollars or these 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 uh, the cost of advertising. So categories like mattresses have uh, uh, where there is still demand in this environment do have kind of an inherent uh, advantage in this window. Okay. Um, I also want to ask you, Mike, about, and you and I have talked about this before, uh, it, you know, what is the, uh, what is the bounce back story for brick and mortar? Uh, the online share really got a COVID bump. Uh, as COVID ebbs, some, um, do brick and mortar stores claw back some of those gains or, or do you think some of those gains are going to be kind of permanently baked in for online? Well, I certainly think that just as we are seeing in this very, what I'd still consider to be very preliminary data as it relates to willingness to try without, or to buy without trying, um, I, I, my expectation from the beginning was that uh, as, as we saw online share spike up, there'd be, it, would, it would be indeed a temporary spike, but it would not settle down to the same trajectory that it had been on before. It'll, it'll most likely be a step function um, it just kind of makes sense. We've seen it in other categories, like, like for example, with Zoom, we're all discovering that, wow, like Zoom is actually more functional for a variety of things, meetings, everything from meetings to catching up with friends than we might've otherwise given it credit for before we were essentially forced to try it. Um, and so the same, I think, will ultimately be said about online mattress shopping for some portion of people. Okay. Uh, I admitted that I was a little bit uh, pessimistic after listening to your talk. Um, how about you? Are you uh, uh, optimistic, pessimistic? Kind of where do you fall on the continuum as you reflect on what you've laid out? Well, I think uh, there's a couple different, like, um, I guess, areas where you have to key in on there. As it relates to COVID and this kind of environment that we're in right now, I'm actually more optimistic than I have been. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, when we did that uh, update on COVID back at the end of April, I mean, I was much more pessimistic as to brick and mortar's chances for uh, rebounding in 2020 uh, wow. at that time. I just felt like consumers were going to be scared to death to go into any physical store that they didn't absolutely have to. Um, and and to, to mattress stores credit, uh, and perhaps to consumers credit, like they've put in place um, uh, procedures to help people feel safe and people have uh, supported those businesses by you know, taking, the, taking the chance to go into those stores and, and, and make those purchases. So we, we, I've been pleasantly surprised by how brick and mortar has rebounded um, since that time. Uh, so in that sense, I guess I'm optimistic. I continue to be uh, relatively optimistic, but at the same time, I recognize <laughs> that this is, you know, this is not over. And so I, I did, I do feel like I'm probably not quite as optimistic as some of the folks have been that I've that I've heard present earlier in the conference. I don't necessarily yeah. think that just because we've seen things increasing over the past couple months that they're going to continue to increase over the next few months. I mean, I think we definitely did see some some pent up demand that was uh, that we sort of a catch up period there. And I think that we also saw maybe what you might view as almost the opposite of pent up demand where it was a nesting effect. People were maybe in those cases deciding to accelerate their mattress purchase ahead of when they otherwise would have done it because of the fact that they are spending all this time in the home. Right. Well, both of those uh, are not unlimited wells. Um, so, I don't necessarily think that that the past few months are, are are a definite predictor of the next few months. Although I do think September is likely to be a year over year win on account of the calendar, just with Labor Day falling more squarely in September. But then October with the election, pre-election stuff, that doesn't look like it's likely to be a, a positive year over year month at all. Um, and and beyond, you know, I'm I'm thinking flat would be pretty good. For, for the rest of this year on, on that sense. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. It is, and I have to say, we have, uh, we have gone a little bit long. Uh, Mike, can't thank you enough. You are always a, uh, just a wellspring of, of analytics, of insights, of calls to action. Uh, you're really an essential part of these betting conferences. So I appreciate all your hard work. I appreciate 
the uh, uh, great effort you always put into these talks. And I encourage you all to uh, reach out and connect with Mike in the chat feature, which is one of the real hits of the conference. Mike, thank you so much. Hope you have a great rest of the day. And we've got one session to go. So uh, you all be getting ready for that. Mike, thanks again. You were great. Thank you, Dave. All right. Enjoyed it. My pleasure. It. All right. Bye-bye.